So the moderator of this stellar lineup of uh, speakers and copyright experts is Paul Keller. Paul is a policy director at Open Future, president and co-founder of Communia Association uh, for the Public Good, uh, for the Public Domain, I'm sorry, research fellow at Iver Institute, the University of Amsterdam, and co-founder also of Creative Commons Netherlands. He is an experienced open policy advocate with an incredible professional background in supporting policies and architectures to improve access to knowledge and culture. So it is really with true pleasure that I hand over to you, Paul, and I look forward to the discussion with you all later. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's indeed an honor to be here. Maybe there's one thing that you should have mentioned in addition to, to what I am is I'm not a lawyer, I haven't studied law, so it's a special honor for me to, to moderate a panel with five law professors here today. Um, I will do my best. Um, I think hopefully the biggest challenge that we will have is to keep people on time and leave a little bit of time at the end um, for discussion. Um, we have a pretty big and uh, a packed schedule with five people. Originally, we were scheduled to speak with six of us, as it was mentioned at the beginning. Valentina Moscon um, can unfortunately not join us for, uh, for health reasons. Um, she mentioned that she would have talked about um, the proposal for the International Instrument on Permitted Uses in Copyright Law, which is actually a, a, a published proposal, which you can all, if you haven't yet, take a look at, I will put the link to it into the chat um, while the others are speaking. Um, and uh, uh, that proposal is also something some of the speakers here today, Martin Zemskleben, who will speak later, and uh, uh, Severine Dussolier, who has opened uh, uh, our event, have also been involved in drafting. So maybe we'll hear a little bit about that in, in Martin's presentation or not. Um, I want to start with uh, 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 introducing Professor Lionel Bentley, who is Herschel Smith, Professor of Intellectual Property and co-director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Law at the University of Cambridge. And he has actually given me the, 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 the most uncertain introduction of what he's going to talk about, because he said he will likely talk, say something about potential flexibility of the quotation exception and the undesirability of limiting quotation to dialogue. And uh, uh, Lionel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, um, I, I wasn't very sure about what I was going to say, um, partly because I wanted to listen to the, what was said at the conference and, and respond to that rather than just wheel out uh, material that I have, have spoken about many times before. Um, I, I think I'll do a bit of both, as it as it turns out. So I wanted to begin by uh, congratulating Severine on on her keynote, um, which it seems to me very usefully throws into a question whether the orientation of today's conference is an interesting one. Is it a is it an interesting question whether there is flexibility in EU copyright law? and uh, particularly in relation to exceptions. And is flexibility uh, the um, characteristic that we most value in those exceptions? And I think in switching the key, as Severine did, she turned us away from thinking about this just as flexibility to actually reorienting us much more around the fundamental goals and purposes of copyright and its limitations. So the question should be, is the breadth and shape of the exceptions to copyright adequate for today's society? Not, is there sufficient flexibility? Because that raises just questions about exactly what kind of flexibility you mean. Are we concerned with certainty versus individualization, et cetera? Uh, so I thought that was extremely valuable and, and it took me to really where my concern lies, which is, whether the breadth of the exceptions within EU copyright law are adequate. And it seems to me that that's a more interesting question to try to answer uh, than the question of whether there's flexibility within EU copyright law. Um, now, coming to 
uh, the uh, the answer to the question, I, I wanted to focus on the area that I've been working on now for a few years, uh, which is the quotation right, and to just ask, well, is the EU copyright laws uh, interpretation of the quotation right adequate either uh, to correspond to its international obligations or adequate for the purposes of uh, the culture within, within which we operate? And my answer to this question is uh, mixed because in the trilogy of cases, it seems to me that there are some good signs, but some very bad signs. And um, when I was thinking about preparing this uh, late last night, um, I was very much focused on the bad signs and I was gonna tell you that the whole of the uh, whole of EU copyright law was a disaster, but, on reflection, it is important to look at the aspects of the Court of Justice's judgments in, in those cases and to see that there are many things uh, that are positive about them. There are avenues they might have taken uh, that uh, um, are, uh, they didn't that would have been even worse than the ones they did. So the starting point is, well, what is the scope and what ought to be the scope of the quotation right? And as Tanya and Atlin and I have written now in a published um, and lengthy, rather lengthy um, uh, uh, essay, long essay book, um, the quotation right is required under international copyright law. It's the only mandatory exception. And it is broad in its form because in Article 10 of the Berne Convention, it's not limited in any way by purpose. So member states that are parties to the Perdon Convention must permit quotation for whatever purpose, as long as it's proportionate to the purpose of the user and is in accordance with fair practice and acknowledges the, um, the, acknowledges the authorship of the work that's quoted. So how far now, now and we take the view, I think, uh, although the book is not normative in character, that Article 10 reflects precisely the sort of position that we want, because it will allow for creative freedom for second comers to use and develop on existing uh, copyright protected material. Um, so that uh, it, it, their uh, creative activities are not unduly limited by having to get prior permission um, to use uh, material that inspires or informs uh, their activities. So how did the CJU do compared to the benchmark of Article 10? Well, firstly, it didn't make the first error of thinking that, art, that the quotation right only applies to literary works or literary contexts, because in Pelham, it clearly acknowledged that the uh, quotation right could be available in relation to musical works. Secondly, it wasn't put off uh, by Article 5 uh, 53D of the EU Information Society's Directive reference to criticism or review, insofar as both Funke Median and Spiegel specifically say that the quotation right is available for other purposes and that those are just illustrative. So that's good too, because Article 10 is, as I said, not limited in any respect by reference to purpose. Indeed, uh, the uh, Advocate General in Pelham went on to say that uh, many quotations, in particular artistic quotations, are not for criticism or review, but pursue other objectives. So that's a very positive sign. Fourthly, in Spiegel, uh, the court went on to say that quotation could be in an unconventional form, reflecting the new digital environment, for example, through hyperlinks. It also said that there was no necessity for a quotation to be incorporated in a copyright work. So the quotation could be in some other way, it doesn't have to be as part of something that constitutes a copyright work, uh, which is a mistake that many uh, or a number of different national legislations um, have uh, implied that the, for there to be a quotation, there must be incorporation of material in a work. And finally, I'd say positively, 
the court offered a rather broad, if vague, uh, notion of when the work is made available by saying it includes when a work, the quoted work is made available, includes when it's made, made available under non contractual license or statutory authorization. So that's the good bit. That's where the court didn't get things hideously wrong. But where I regard the court as making some serious errors is in the, intro in the introduction into EU law, copyright law for the purposes of the quotation of the requirement to enter into dialogue with the copyright work. And uh, the Court of Justice um, does this in um, Article, uh, sorry, paragraph 71 of uh, this, the Pelham decision and paragraph 78 of Spiegel. It says the essential characteristics of quotation are the use by a user other than the copyright holder of a work or more generally of an extract of a work for the purposes of illustrating an assertion, defending an opinion or allowing an intellectual comparison between that work and the assertions of that user. Since the user of, protective, uh, of a protected work wishing to rely on the quotation exception must therefore have the intention of entering into dialogue with that work. Now, what, if one looks at that closely, it can be an extremely worrying paragraph insofar as it implies that there might be only a, a, a narrow number of purposes for which a quotation can legitimately be used. Illustrating an assertion, defending an opinion, or allowing an intellectual comparison. But it seems clear to me that the core of that paragraph is in fact merely uh, the requirement of an intention to enter into dialogue with the work. And we can see this, I think, from the fact that the Court of Justice in Pelham itself uh, recognizes the possibility for a musical work, such as in Pelham, to fall within one of those, uh, fall, to, to count as quotation. And it's difficult really to know how a bit of music illustrates an assertion, a bit of music in another bit of music illustrates an assertion, depends an opinion or allows for an intellectual comparison. So it seems to me that by saying that this might be a quotation, uh, depending on uh, the particularities of the case, uh, the Court of Justice seems to acknowledge actually that all that's required is an intention to enter into dialogue not specifically an intention in to enter into dialogue by one of those three possibilities. And that's important because uh, the Advocate General, for example, had, illustrate, had said the intention to enter into dialogue could be, for example, paying tribute to a work. And that's a much broader kind of engagement than uh, those ones that are, are mentioned specifically in paragraph 71. Nevertheless, I do th even though I think this is construable then as quite a broad and open textured requirement that has indeed some flexibility for, what's that, for, for what that is worth. It is nevertheless, to my mind, an unfortunate and unnecessary uh, limitation on the quotation right. And I say this for a variety of reasons. So Paul, am I over time? Yes, you're slowly getting a little bit over time, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll wind up very quickly. Firstly, okay. there's nothing in the ordinary meaning of quotation that requires this limitation. Secondly, there is specifically uh, a, a historical background to Article 10 of Byrne that indicates that this requirement is in fact not uh, one uh, that is um, legitimate in terms of international law. And thirdly, it seems to me that it is inconsistent with a whole range of different quotation practices uh, that we obviously want, would want to allow within the quotation rights, such as, for example, dictionaries of quotation. Thanks, Paul. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we, we uh, escaped the you portraying the entire thing as a complete disaster, like there's at least some hope. And I think uh, some of our next speakers are going to look into, into ways how we can increase flexibilities in copyright law beyond directly looking at the exceptions and limitations itself. And the first one um, who will make such an argument is Tatiana Sinodino, 
for she's associate professor of private and commercial law at the University of Cyprus. And uh, she's going to speak to us on soft law norms and instruments as a means to provide more flexibility in EU copyright law. Tatiana, the floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks for this introduction. Also, I would like to thank uh, Recreating Europe for the invitation to join this exciting event and also to congratulate all the previous speakers for our excellent presentations, which are all complimentary. In this uh, very short presentation, I will uh, mostly share with you some thoughts on whether, why and how soft law norms and instruments could add more flexibility in European copyright law. First of all, we must admit that there is a current trend of rise of soft law in European copyright law. And uh, while soft law in the past was mainly used in the domain of the enforcement of copyright law and mostly at the national level, both with the DSM directive, but also with uh, the proposal for the regulation of the Digital Services Act, uh, we, we see that there is uh, a use of soft law norms and instruments in order to balance the interests between the right holders and the users. Uh, regarding the DSM directive, we can refer, for instance, in Article 3, the TDM for research exception, where uh, we can see that member states are, uh, shall encourage the right holders and the cultural heritage organization to define commonly agreed best practices for the modalities of the application of this exception. In the much contested Article 17, Paragraph 9, we can see that Member States shall ensure the availability of out-of-court redress mechanisms for the resolution of disputes regarding the disabling of access to content or the removal of content that has been uploaded by the users. In the proposal for a regulations in the Digital Services Act, we can also see uh, the same trend of rise of soft law in Article 35, for instance, we can see that codes of conduct are mentioned as a main instrument for a better balancing between the interests at stake. And uh, it is also highlighted that these codes of conduct shall take into account the interests of the citizens of the European Union, so the interests of the users. So soft law norms and instruments are already a kind of reality in European copyright law. Certainly, the most important question is whether, why, and how these mechanisms should add more flexibility in European copyright law. First of all, soft law known instruments uh, are by their nature an expression of a dialogical conception of law, since they are bottom-up guidelines which have been developed by the parties themselves. Even if they are not binding, they could uh, uh, help the emergence of a customary conduct in specific field which later may, may also be endorsed by the courts. Uh, moreover, these instruments, soft law instruments, uh, embrace and promote a universalist approach on copyright law, since uh, uh, often the interests of each category of stakeholders, the interests of the users, the interests of the right holders, the interests of platforms worldwide often coincide. In this context, uh, we can see that uh, copyright law, online copyright law, does not avoid the general trend of the prevalence of a multi-stakeholder approach in all internet-related issues, from the structure of ICANN to the governance of internet, etc. Specif specifically regarding copyright exceptions, these instruments, this norm, uh, could uh, help to ensure uh, more effectiveness for copyright exceptions. Indeed, Copyright exceptions, uh, most of copyright exceptions, are designed to apply in a variety of situations. However, in practice, the application of the three-step test restricts their scope of application. Uh, so, legal uncertainty often prevails, and uh, what is done is that uh, disputes are resolved by courts on a case-by-case -case basis. In this context, a multi-stakeholder approach could offer the possibility for a better negotiation of the range of copyright exceptions in specific fields. However, some clarification here is necessary. All these mechanisms can be truly uh, effective only if they are used to complement mandatory copyright exceptions. A second condition also for the true effectiveness of such mechanisms is that uh, uh, users' organizations are part of the norm-creating uh, process. 
Regarding out-of-court uh, resolution mechanisms, a lot has been said about the advantages of alternative dispute resolution uh, regarding that the parties can save uh, money, they can uh, save time, they can or even uh, reach creative results. For example, a right holder could uh, co-decide with uh, a user to co jointly commercially exploit a user-generated content. However, here, some safeguards are necessary. Uh, alternative dispute uh, entities must comply with strong quality requirements. They need to be independent from the stakeholders and at the same time they need to be impartial. In this respect, it's regret regretful that uh, the DSM directive did not provide for this kind of uh, safeguards. The question has been left to the discretion of the member states. We have uh, the member states have to be vigilant on how to implement these provisions in a way uh, to make them effective. Uh, regarding the ongoing uh, proposal for a regulation for the Digital Services Act, uh, here, of course, soft law norms and instruments are mentioned. However, the draft in its present form does not go as uh, far as it should have been. And here, some amelioration uh, would be welcome. Uh, the issue is not settled. This is an ongoing process. So we can still ask for some uh, safeguards in order to make these mechanisms more effective, uh, such as uh, the involvement, the meaningful involvement of the user's organization in the creation of such codes of conduct and similar norms. And also, why not thinking about uh, binding best practices? So. Uh, in conclusion, I could say that uh, soft law norms and instruments are already a reality in European copyright law, and they could theoretically bring some more flexibility. This uh, approach is also consistent with uh, the fundamental equilibrium, which is represented by the copyright law ecosystem itself. The relationship between the right holders, the authors, uh, the users, the public, and also the producers. At the same time, uh, this approach has certainly its own limits, and uh, I believe that it can be only complementary and uh, that uh, only legislative reforms could bring paradigm shifts in European copyright law. So this was it, and thank you so much for your in the invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, this was was really interesting also because parts of it is very recognizable as having been involved in some of these processes that you referenced as part of a user's organization. Um, and I, I agree with your last point that we should not see this as kind of like a replacement for, for formal legislative um, changes as well. Um, let's go on to our next speaker, um, Maurizio Borghi, who is Professor at Law and Director of the Center for Intellectual Property Policy and Management at Bournemouth University. And uh, he will take us back to the other side a little bit. Um, he uh, wants to share a few comments about achieving flexibility in the construction of the scope of rights, uh, reproduction, communication to the public, instead of in the application of exception. And uh, the floor is yours, Maurizio. <clears throat> You are still on mute. Now? Now we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Katerina, for the invitation. And uh, yes, as, as you said, Paul, I want to make a few, just a few comments on uh, um, another side of flexibility. So flexibility is normally, rightly so, is associated with, uh, with exceptions and limitations. And uh, this for good reasons, um, and also for not so good reasons, in my, in my view. One not so good reason is that uh, this, uh, um, this way is, uh, uh, is essentially the way that, uh, that American copyright law works, and uh, uh, which has had much influence also on this side of the Atlantic, but is, is not something that should be uh, automatically uh, assumed for granted. Okay, so copyright law uh, with, the, with, the, with this fantastic and broad, uh, flexible, fair use uh, defense works uh, pretty much in, in, in this sense, in the, in, in the sense of, of uh, using the fair use defense uh, as, uh, um, as a flexible 
uh, instrument. Um, EU copyright law perhaps has some different, uh, uh, as a different approach, and I will, I will make a few points about uh, flexibility at the level of the construction of rights instead as to the application of uh, exceptions. So uh, first, uh, um, I want to make a point about flexibility as such. So um, flexibility is meant to be a tool to accommodate free uses that are not expressly captured by exceptions. But flexibility uh, works also the other way around. So it works in a way to avoid using exceptions to give, for example, to give free pass to each and every use made by tech companies. So we have seen the, uh, the European Court, for example, uh, refusing the application of private copy to uh, remote cloud recording uh, services. And, and we have seen also European courts um, denying the use of the quotation exception for uh, automatic extraction made by some algorithms of some tech companies. So flexibility works in, the, in, in two ways. Um, and now we say something about the, uh, the EU way. So the, uh, what I think in my view is an emerging trend, an emerging approach of uh, uh, EU jurisprudence. Uh, as I said, flexibility at the level of the construction of construction of the scope of rights. Okay, so, and uh, the, um, there are two ways, I think, in which uh, flexibility can be achieved in this respect. One is by adopting a normative rather than a technical approach to, uh, to the rights. Uh, and the second one, which is closely related, is to adopt a purposive rather than literal approach to, uh, to rights. And the two more important rights um, in copyright as are reproduction and communication to the public. So in the, in the way the, the European Court has construed communication to the public, um, we, um, we have seen that the, uh, this right has been uh, interpreted in, in a, uh, including various elements, in particular including elements of uh, secondary liability. So, uh, and these are received some criticism and myself, I'm not particularly um, enthusiast about the way the um, right of communication to the public has been construed across all the hyperlinking cases. I think there has been lots of confusion. Um, but in the end, at the end of the day, this uh, interpretation, this construal has achieved some flexibility, flexi flexibility enough to adapt to individual cases in a predictable way, reasonably predictable way. And um, of course, the interpretation is not, is not perfect. Uh, but if you compare the uh, fair use cases in the US, uh, in uh, the US jurisprudence has addressed the uh, hyperlinking cases uh, using the fair use um, defense instead of uh, the construction of, of right, uh, you don't see much difference and you don't see uh, that uh, uh, the, um, the fair use uh, approach has uh, led to more flexibility or more predictability. I, I would say quite on the contrary. Uh, moving to the reproduction right. Well, uh, reproduction, we, we have a, a long um, a line of cases on the exception for temporary reproduction which is to be frank, a bit of a mess with uh, all these five conditions that uh, uh, overlap in, uh, in many respects. Uh, but on the other side, there is a, a sort of a purposive approach that is uh, gaining ground. And beyond the, um, the discussion on the, uh, the, the exception for a temporary reproduction, the European Court has also explored a purposive approach in other cases. Um, for example, when acts of reproduction are necessary to enable a permitted act. Okay, this is the case in, in Technische Universität Darmstadt. Okay, so here the reproduction 
for making the work available by means of dedicated terminals uh, is an act that is not expressly recognized in the, in the exception, but the court took the view that this act uh, is uh, inevitable or is necessary in order to um, enable the, um, the permitted act. Um, and there is another case, um, um, a recent case of October uh, 2020 is a, is a Swedish uh, um, uh, referral, which in my view demonstrates that the court is uh, open to consider further situations, okay, where um, a purposive approach can be, uh, can be used to, uh, to construe the scope of the reproduction right, reproduction and communication to the public. And, uh, and this is a case about the transmission of a work to a court as evidence in legal proceedings. Okay, so in many jurisdictions, this is covered by, um, by an exception. There is also um, a limited exception included in the information statute directly in Article 5 for uh, use uh, um, of uh, copyright works in administrative and judicial proceedings. Um, however, interestingly, the court um, did not even need to discuss the scope of the exception to decide that this kind of use does not fall within reproduction and communication to the public rights. Uh, it was enough to, uh, refer to give reference to, uh, um, to the right of effective remedy and fair trial in Article 47 of the EU Charter. So this was sufficient for the court to conclude that the uh, transmission of a war to a court uh, as evidence in, in legal proceedings is not an act of uh, communication to the public. And the reproduction was not even uh, considered in the sense that it was uh, somehow implicitly permitted. Okay, so in this case, it was, it was I think, a, a photograph okay, that was used as evidence in, in judicial proceedings. So this is a very narrow, um, narrow case that is, uh, that maybe sits comfortably within, within the scope of, of exceptions, but it's interesting in my view to see that the court took uh, clearly a purposive approach to, uh, to the construction of rights. And uh, I think this is, uh, um, I think is a promising way in which uh, flexibility can be achieved also on other situations that do not fall uh, comfortably within the scope, within the literal scope of exceptions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for reminding us of the kind of like the power that the court actually has in shaping this field. Um, we'll, we'll move forward with uh, Professor Martin Senftleben, who's Professor of Intellectual Property Law and Director of the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. Full disclosure, he's also uh, the chair of the board of Open Future. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, un between unremunerated permitted uses and prohibition power for copyright holders, why Europe must cultivate solutions based on remunerated use privileges and how it can do that. The floor is yours, Martin. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, thanks so much to the organizers. It, it has been a great event so far already. And I hope to contribute a little bit. Um, what I have in mind is a reality check. And so uh, bear with me. I'm not so sure if at the end you will find that my comment is as diplomatic as Lionel's and uh, the other comments have been so far. Um, because if you ask me, th this whole copyright flexibilities question in uh, Europe is really a very difficult one. The status quo is, I would say, lamentable. Uh, European policymakers just don't understand this thing. Um, we don't get the message across, even though there has been really, really important academic work in this area. So let me take it step by step. I follow um, the keynote which um, Severin um, has provided and which um, put the different options so brilliantly in different boxes. So I start with what I would call the exceptions and limitations in the proper sense. 
And I mean, again, look at what we have done in academic uh, discussion and work. We have pointed out that we have such a slow legislative process in Europe that it doesn't make sense to have a piecemeal approach and adopt specific exceptions and limitations that more flexible approaches like fair use that function well in the US without ruining the creative industries and so on would really make sense. We have pointed out that there is a strong fundamental underpinning for more exceptions and limitations and broader exceptions and limitations that it is a necessity to adopt this in order to keep pace and so on and so forth. And what do we get? I mean, look at this lamentable 2019 legislation, piecemeal approach all over the place. Um, the, 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 the little steps that have been taken fragmented into very complex provisions that leave rooms for so many discussions and interpretive um, quarrels and so on. I mean, and on top of that, we have contracts that may override the exceptions and limitations in many cases. We have um, technological protection measures um, the, that are still impacting exceptions and limitations. We have the famous three-step test. Please don't get me starting on the three-step test. Applying this at the EU law level is, is wrong uh, from the very beginning, but I mean, for some reason, we love this in Europe. And then on top of that, I mean, Lionel, um, this was great how you framed it, but the Pelham decision and the approach taken by the Court of Justice in Palham and the other cases is just fundamentally wrong. If you face such a straight jacket of exceptions and limitations, how can you say that fundamental rights must be safeguarded within this straight jacket? And I mean, in the light of your work on quotation and so on, we already see that this will just not work. So, um, what do we get instead of this? Well, I mean, as Severin has pointed out, with these inflexible structures for the true exceptions and limitations, of course, the whole system is very much in favor of copyright owners. So we give copyright owners, the creative industries, a veto right, a right to prohibit use. And this veto right allows the creative industries in Europe to control new technologies, so under the new 2019 legislation, um, the creative industries are in control of text and data mining and how stupid robots will be in Europe. The creative industries are in charge of regulating um, the platform economy. We put the creative industries on top of all the other industries. That's a good thing for the creative industries. And I fully agree that creative industries should be remunerated, should be fully remunerated. But the creative industries, I'm sorry to say, are not known for being the most innovative ecosystem among all the industries. So giving one of the more traditional industry branches a say about other industries is just not a very good policy, I would say. And on top of that, the strong veto right, prohibition right focus in EU policymaking is restricting user freedoms to a large extent, whether the court says this has a fundamental rights color or not. I mean, at the end of the day, we have seen what the court then does in terms of interpretation, and I'm not convinced. Also, the approach taken in TU Darmstadt perhaps only reflects another point that is the very narrow right by right approach. So there was this library use and the court looked at all the individual types of using steps, all individual steps of reproduction, of making available, and looked for an exception covering each individual step of the use. Instead of saying this is important library use, um, we need a solution that covers the whole thing as a phenomenon in real life, um, the court divided this into each individual step. So is there hope for Europe? No worries, I, I will end with a positive note. Yes, of course, of course, there's, there's always hope. And I'm one of the most um, positive uh, people in the copyright community, believe it or not. Otherwise I would have stopped already and switched to trademark law, which is much more fun anyway. So, um, so, so, so what is the good news? Um, I think there is lots of room in Europe to develop um, the remunerated use privileges. We must be very careful about framing. So I saw in the conference program that you, you used ugly words like compulsory licensing or statutory licensing. Don't do this. 
don't do this. I mean, these are licensing opportunities, which the copyright system offers, even though it concerns users that from a fundamental rights perspective would not fall under the control of the creative industries in the first place. So the industry gets something on top of what they are entitled to have. So it's a premium that we offer. And I would say we should offer that premium in particular in two respects. First of all, text and data mining. Um, the European legislator in its wisdom has chosen for a licensing based approach in Article 4 of the, of the uh, DSM directive. So we have to live with this. The only way of making the system work is now to have as efficient licensing opportunities as possible. I think we need a strong improvement of copyright data for that purpose. And we have to ensure that the licensing infrastructure works very well. But as Severin has said, as other commentators have said, in principle, text and data mining is something that does not even fall under the copyright monopoly because it is not used of the work for enjoyment and so on. So that is something which the creative industries get on top of what is logically theirs. And the other case is um, the pastiche exemption, um, which from my perspective should be um, interpreted to become a general UGC exception. Um, and then for that purpose, even though it is an expressive use, um, we would have licensing opportunities in the sense of levies, which have to be paid by online platforms. But also for this, we need very efficient licensing infrastructures. And this brings me to a final point. And I'm not so sure if I should say this at all, because actually I wanted to die a natural death. Um, but I was at risk earlier when I said fair use would be a good idea for Europe. So here comes another one. We have to abolish at some point the national collecting societies. I'm sorry to say this. I'm really sorry to say this. And I think how I, I know how difficult this is and how much uh, national flavor and so on all these collecting societies have. They, they are the holy grail and so on and so forth but they don't do the job because it is just too fragmented. So we have to think about bringing the whole collecting society system to the higher level of the EU. And this is also important for individual authors and performers because according to the distribution schemes of the collecting societies, they get a share of the revenue automatically. If the licensing process via collecting societies remains frustrating, um, the big industries will look for other contractual partners for negotiations, that's other big industries. Um, and so um, in that sense, I think um, it will be a bad solution also for the individual authors and uh, performers. How we bring the collecting societies to the European level, I'm not so sure. I have said, uh, perhaps we have to abolish the national collecting societies pretty sure this will never happen in any foreseeable future, but then we need extra stimuli to enhance collaboration between these societies and really making the licensing system more pan-European without getting extra fragmented as we have seen it at the moment in the area of music licensing, where it's hard to decipher where you get um, a license for the whole European market at which individual collecting society you have to be. So there is really room for improvement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. That was, uh, that was impressive. It turns the direction in a somewhat unexpected way from um, talking about flexibilities to abolishing, or I don't think you're abolished, you, you spoke in favor of abolishing collecting societies, but bringing them to the European level. Um, that is, uh, that, it, that is quite a tall order, but at least it's something on the policy agenda for the future. Um, we have one last speaker and, uh, or one last panelist uh, in, in this round, and uh, that brings us sort of full circle because we're going back to Katharina Skanger, who I do not need to introduce because she introduced herself at the beginning of, of the event. Um, she's uh, 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 going to talk about adopting a horizontal approach and reading of copyright flexibilities on the basis of the essential function of copyright and provide some examples um, how this could work. The floor is yours. Um, let's see. I hope we have a couple of minutes afterwards for discussions. If uh, people have questions, comments, put them into the chat so I can see if I can throw something to the panelists um, while Katarina speaks. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Paul, and thank you all speakers for the wonderful inputs they gave us. Uh, so my job now is particularly hard because how to add uh, something to what you already heard. So I think that my uh, take now will be a sort of connecting the dots of what you already heard. Uh, and it's very much in line with what Severin addressed in her very inspiring keynote. And as I said, it picks a bit of uh, each and every intervention you heard until now. Well, the idea I developed, particularly while working on the data sets we collected in the past year and a half in Europe on public sources on copyright flexibilities broadly intended, is that compared to more dynamic and adaptive legal systems, we miss horizontal principles that are able to inform the development of all forms of copyright flexibilities in a consistent fashion. The feeling we all have, and you heard already, is that of a patchwork of ad hoc solutions that don't offer grounds for generalization. It's true that something changed recently, so think about the mandatory nature of exceptions in some EU directives, extended collective licensing as a way to pursue also public interest goals, the partial reordering uh, impressed by the Grand Chamber Trio in July 2019, particularly in the role of exceptions and fundamental rights. However, there are still plenty of instances where there is no real consistency in the methods of interpretation and in the principles that are used in different areas of copyright flexibilities. I believe that the greatest example of this is the approach to digital exhaustion in Tom Cabinet. But there are also outstanding challenges in the development of the fair balance doctrine, most importantly, the missing definition of the essence of copyright, or the fact that the proportionality test is still too vague, too fact-based, and it's completely written by uncertainty. Not to mention that it's still not clear what is the relationship between this new course of case law and the interpretation of the three-step test which remains the uh, next post filter for the application of exception, which is completely market oriented. This lack of clarity, this lack of consistency in the directions that are taken by EU copyright law, weakened also, and this we saw it particularly in our mapping, the ability of national courts to contribute bottom up to harmonization and to remedy to the fragmentation caused by the InfoSoc directive and later interventions. The question then is what can we do to change this course and at which level? My take is quite simple. Against this background of fast, too fast technological developments, constant changes in business models, constant changes in the interplay between conflict and needs, we must probably strive to adopt a common and open conceptualization of copyright flexibilities, as technologically neutral as possible. This can inform both judicial and legislative actions and also be in line with the current paradigm shift we are facing, where the great distinction between author's rights and copyright traditions is basically dissolving. And we are moving towards what I would call a European flavored incentive based model. This framework would inspire all balancing tools from the definition of the scope of exclusive rights to exceptions statutory or compulsory licenses. I know that Martin doesn't like the definition, but I tend to be a bit, uh, how to say, old fashioned in using the terms uh, uh, adopted by also national legislators. Exhaustion, the definition of protected works and so on, all as part of a unitary category, which shares the goal of ensuring that the boundaries of copyright and between copyright and conflicting interests, conflicting rights, conflicting policy goals are correctly set. I believe that there is no need to reinvent the wheel because the solution is already out there and it's represented by the doctrine of essential function of copyright law. Back in the 70s, so not really yesterday actually, the court used the notion explicitly to balance between copyright, competition and fundamental freedoms. Then in 2019 in Pelham, the court did it implicitly when it drew the boundaries of reproduction right of phonogram producers by excluding samples used in a new work and which are unrecognizable to the ear. And it did it because it said that such a protection was not necessary to safeguard the function of the right, which was protecting producers' investment against parasitic competition, quite different than what happens for Article 2 in general on reproduction right for authors. Basically, the court used for the first time the fair balance doctrine and defined the boundary of an exclusive right by adopting 
a function-based approach when looking at the interplay between copyright and fundamental rights. Now, despite this relatively conceptual clarity and usefulness of this doctrine, the essential function was not even vaguely taken into account in the Tom Cabinet case on digital exhaustion. It did not inform at all recent decisions on the definition of protected works, apart from probably in Kaufman a bit, and it has played absolutely no role in the fair balance proportionality assessment. But I would say that this horizontal approach to copyright flexibilities would be useful because it would abandon the dichotomy rights versus exceptions. And it would have a great systemic advantages of using the same theological principles to draw the boundaries of exclusivity, no matter with which instruments. And it would turn our attention back again to the public interest calls for which the rights have been granted in the first place. Of course, I know we can discuss whether or not the functions of copyright are univocal and clear. I believe that they are, and they are quite structured. There are quite structured legislative data converging around specific clusters, economic, social, and cultural. Anyway, if we look at copyright flexibility as instruments to ensure that copyright performs their essential, its essential functions while not necessarily constraining conflicting rights or the realization of public interest goals, this would have an important impact on the way how we conceptualize at the same time the object, the content, and the structure of copyright. And let me briefly conclude with some examples so that hopefully we have some time for questions because I see that the chat is turning very active now and I'm very happy to see this. So as to the object, the doctrine would justify a function-based definition of the subject matter of copyright and of the borders between copyright and other rights in case of overlaps. Think about Spiegel Online. They did something like this. Then it would also allow courts to take into account in the balance the social relevance and functions of different works and the status of different right holders, exactly as courts normally do in their property jurisprudence, if we really believe that at the end of the day, copyright is a property right, as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union states. As to the content, the doctrine would help defining the scope of exclusive rights on objective grounds, as it was hinted in Palin. So when striking the balance, the courts would look not at generic copyright entitlement, but at its essence, considering only those acts which are essential for copyright to perform its institutional goals and excluding those acts which hamper the fulfillment of its social cultural objective. Such an approach, in my opinion, would have probably led to different results in the shaping of distribution and communication to the public and probably to a different output also in the Tom Cabinet case on digital exhaustion. As to the structuring with this, I conclude, the doctrine would help in at least four aspects. First, it would put in context and fully support the approach to exceptions adopted in Funke Median, Pelham and Spiegel online. Second, it would uh, finally give a more detailed and foreseeable content to the notion of fair balance and proportionality, since it would force courts to look at the essence of copyright linking it to ins its institutional goals. Third, they would give legislators uh, a guide to distinguish between gratuitous exceptions and legitimate paid uses, which would help broadening the variety of limitations by playing with property and liability rules on the basis of the function of appropriate remuneration. So not remuneration, but appropriate remuneration. And last, and with this really I conclude, the doctrine may also constituted guidance to distinguish between legitimate and abusive exercises of exclusive rights, working as a closing provision in the arsenal of copyright flexibility rules. That's enough on my side now. I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, and probably everybody can see like this, uh, a bit of discussion on on multiple strands suddenly in in the comments as we as we come to a close of this event. Um, I think there's uh, uh, and I want to give the speakers uh, the ability uh, uh, to react to some of these. I want to highlight two comments here. One which was made and let me find that by whom um, by Patrick Zill, um that who notes it remains unclear how you can achieve the level of flexibility desired by some speakers on a European basis 
without entirely rewriting the copyright framework. There's still no harmonization of moral rights unless you want them abandoned. A harmonized, flexible, and even or even fair use style exception seems to be difficult to implement without constantly interfering into the national competences. So the question maybe of an entire rewrite of the European copyright framework um, would be probably a bit of a too big of an ask, but like I would like the speakers to reflect on this idea. What would be the next thing you want European policymakers to address? If you can express that in one or two sentences, we've heard examples from, uh, uh, from Martin who spoke towards like the need to bring uh, collecting societies to the European level. Um, we heard a couple of other things, but if we can do a round in the order of where we've spoken before, so starting with Lionel, is there one or two sentences about where you think European policymakers should intervene next in the copyright framework in order to improve flexibilities? Well, I don't know what, about whether to improve flexibilities, but um, you know, the European Copyright Society and before that the Fitton Project have been arguing for a long time for a single European Union law of copyright covering you know, all aspects, all, all the major aspects of copyright law, including uh, moral rights and authors' contracts and so forth. And we've started to see some move towards that in the authors' contracts provisions of the Digital Single Market Directive. Uh, but the, uh, the person who wrote the comment, whose name I can't recall, is absolutely right. Moral rights have, have not yet been harmonized. And uh, I think that would be a, a good thing if, if they were. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's go next to, I forgot the order which we had originally. I think Tatiana was second in our round. Thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, I also believe that uh, we shall move towards the codification of uh, European copyright law sooner or later. And uh, I also believe that this is the only way also to have uh, um, a strong uh, European copyright law rule, balance rule, because we need to think also to the conceptual identity of uh, European copyright law. Codification is not a, a technical process, it's not a consolidation of the existing vacuum. We should think uh, proactively in a way that uh, um, the conceptual identity of this new European copyright law uh, is uh, structured. And I believe this will be the only way also to promote solutions in favor of creators and of the public, also at the international level, because if we see now the enormous power of uh, uh, platforms worldwide, it's very difficult uh, to um, achieve to balance solutions and also to enforce copyright law for the favor of creators worldwide. So I believe that uh, this approach, uh, including moral rights, including contract law, including all this kind of taboo about codification should be followed. Why not also authorship, uh, uh, exceptions also in favor of competition, something that has been missed out. Many thanks for this question. Thank you. Um, then the next speaker we had was, I think, Maurizio. Yes, I would just add another, another point to what Lionel and Tatiana said just now is uh, probably secondary liability. So now we have the e-commerce directive, now we have the DSM directive that, and, uh, that have addressed the limitations to liability for a certain category, which now is getting more complicated with this new category of super platforms. So uh, I think uh, the, and I, as I was mentioning in my intervention, the right of communication to the public has been complicated by the fact of incorporating elements of secondary liability. So I think this is an area that probably deserves some, uh, some clarity, some legal certainty, um, also beyond copyright, okay, also in, in respect to other IP rights. Okay, thanks. And I think we, like Martin, feel free to, uh, to, to provide maybe additional suggestions for policymakers, although you already did. And I was thinking maybe also since Severine um, reacted to your proposal, it might be interesting to also have Severine as the opener of, of, of this conference to maybe reflect a little bit on what she heard. So like I invite both of you, maybe Martin first and then Severine um, uh, to come back to us with some suggestions here as well. 
Yeah, thanks so much. Um, well, as I said, uh, con con considering the results of the 2019 reform, I'm not so sure if I want to see the EU legislator taking care of copyright as an general package altogether in the near future, um, I would not advise in this direction. Perhaps we end up with uh, something that we even like less than the current framework. So don't don't even think about this, I would say. So let me focus on the last point I was making because this also triggered a bit of discussion in the chat. Um, don't get me wrong, collecting societies do a great job. And I think they are of very, but they are very important um, for several national systems. The only thing is that um, I don't see them operating very efficiently at the European level. And this is, first of all, I guess, because there's not too much trust among them. Uh, the greater societies, the bigger societies trying to take care of pan-European licensing, whereas the smaller societies uh, then find that they are left behind. Um, it's, it's very difficult to bring them under one general umbrella. And that's really a lost opportunity. I mean, also as a commentator, I would have much less difficulty agreeing with a policy making based on in particular licensing if we had an efficient pan-European licensing system in place. And I'm also saying this because the uh, repartitioning schemes of collecting societies, as, as I said at the beginning, is not too bad. I mean, when you look at the repartitioning schemes, that, that's an automatic way of channeling income, new royalties directly to authors and performers without running through um, industry branches first and without much reliance on copyright contract law, which at the end might not be too efficient or at least not as efficient as we would like it to see. So um, what I'm saying about collecting societies is not because I want to abolish them in the sense of making uh, room for uh, some new players that, that might have much more doubtful services than the established collecting societies, but I'm saying this because I like this system so much and I think it is a strength of European copyright law to have those but there must be some initiative to bring this system at EU level and if we can achieve this I'm also much more willing to accept all these piecemeal approaches and little commas and things that we see in the area of exceptions and limitations. So um, that would be the next step forward to start a discussion on how to bring um, the collecting society system in its fragmented form at the moment really at the European level in the sense of allowing national societies to have a word to say in the sense of allowing the initiatives of societies to uh, preserve natural culture and fund natural culture, culture to continue. Um, and this will be a very complex exercise, but we have to start at some point because this is really a missed opportunity. Okay, thank you. Severin, do you want to share some thoughts? Thank you, Paul. But it was not, it's not easy to conclude after that. I, I, and I, it won't be in conclusion in any way. So yes, I, I agree with most um, of what Martin said, actually. So after I just erupted when he said that he would like the collective society to, 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 to go, I would have advised him, yes, to run for cover, because it's not really safe things to say today. But what my point about collecting society is that exactly what he said, if we want to, to deal with pan-European licensing, and there was some attempt to do so in you know, 2005 with some recommendation from the European Commission, etc. It just led to uh, concentration of collecting societies that led to um, more uh, power asymmetries in the market, less cultural diversity and less remuneration for creators and authors and performers. So that would not be my point. So my point is that collecting society, and I agree with all the critiques that has been, that, that, that you could address to some collecting society. My point is that if you just leave everything to the forces of market, it will be to the detriment of authors and performers. And I agree with some comments that was made in the chat that authors themselves are very innovative and sometimes they are more innovative than the collective representatives. And they also develop apps to be able to manage their rights. But still, you know, they just enter into, into a negotiation that might be very difficult. So my point would be that I, we should really push forward the, 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 the real guarantee of a remuneration right to the others. So not only some 
you know, um, protection of artists through contracts, but the fact that yes, collecting society could should be able to come directly collect some money, not from producers and publishers, but from big platforms and big exploiters. And for that, we need collecting societies. And also during the crisis, during the pandemic crisis that we just uh, that we are still in, I know that, for instance, in Belgium, the collecting societies have done amazing work to just support the creators, the authors, and, and, and try to give them some money and try to, to also change their legal status. So, you know, I really, I'm really attached to those collecting society that do that, that, that do their job. And as to um, answer to, to what Tatiana suggested and Lionel too, I know that I would also be in favor of some sort of codification or, you know, you need to recopyright at European Union level. But I agree with Martin that for the moment, it seems like just opening a Pandora box. If we launch that discussion uh, today, it might be even worse than when we have. So um, I don't know, I'm really mixed uh, on that point. Okay, um, and with that, before I hand it back to Katarina, let me, me try to give like a little bit of a summary of the discussion. So I see two meta trends, right? Like, and I think that started also with Serene's initial presentation that really like, if we want to think about flexibility or user's rights, um, to, to use a different term, like we can't do this without thinking about like the remuneration infrastructures around it. That's pretty much the discussion between Martin and, 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 and Severine. And I think it, I'm, I'm very happy that they, you both also seem to have like co come into a similar place at the end again. Um, so thank you for that. And the other thing, which is probably much more difficult to come with a um, sort of hopeful concluding or, or future pointing remark is that we're seeing like that, that the increasing complexity of the system, right? Like that we are building, um, I think it was Tatiana who used the term patchwork earlier, makes it much, much harder to even imagine a way forward to the, um, to the, to the point where, where people like Martin, I think rightfully um, point out that it might be risky to open up discussions at this moment. So this is probably more of a long-term project. Um, at Comunia, for example, we are thinking like we did 10 policy recommendations 10 years ago, and we're thinking, we've started a process of thinking about what we can do in the next 10 years. So maybe this is something that more deserves like a longer time horizon. Um, we will come back with that information on that later. For now, I want to thank all the participants in this panel, all the participants in the other parts of the conference. I could uh, follow parts of it for your contributions. I also like, uh, as, as Katrina pointed out at the beginning, this is a mid-term thing of a longer running project. So there is also still a lot of time to generate more insights, generate, like consolidate them into policy recommendations. And I'm very much looking forward to, to, to hearing more from Recreating Europe. Um, over the next year. And with that, I hand back to you, Katerina, for some final words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for this uh, wrap up, which was uh, really um, wonderful because uh, it gives me now the opportunity to keep my concluding remarks very short because uh, uh, we already run out of time. The problem of Zoom is always that uh, you develop this fatigue, but then when the discussion starts, you would never let it finish and unfortunately now we need to conclude but I want to leave also some hope in the sense that the discussion doesn't finish here with recreating Europe we are organizing another conference to celebrate pardon me the word the implementation of the CDSMD directive which as you know member states are supposed to transpose by the 7th of June we're gonna have another recreating Europe conference in the afternoon of the 21st of June called the implementation of the CDSM directive, snapshots into the future of EU copyright law. That will be a bit of a different type because we will showcase the results of the project, not only with regard to exceptions and limitations, but also with regards to remuneration uh, and reversion, uh, intermediary uh, platform liabilities and preservation of cultural heritage. You will find more information about it very soon, uh, starting from tomorrow on Twitter, Facebook and our website, www.recreating.eu. Let me just conclude by saying that indeed the discussion uh, just started and uh, as soon as more results are out, we will for sure uh, making it ongoing. 
Thank you very much once again uh, for all the speakers uh, uh, involved in the conference, both from inside and outside. Recreating Europe, that was really, really exciting. And I took plenty of notes to share with the partners later on to orient the second half of the project. Thank you very much once again, and we look forward to host you in our next event. Is Rachel here? I gotta talk to her. No, she's not shopping. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.